Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm David Wu. Welcome to The Money Game, where we make actionable predictions about the big stories shaping the world today. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is designed for anyone who's interested in learning about what makes our world tick. Please subscribe at davidwombound.com if you haven't done so already. To my subscribers, I hope you got my email earlier in the week and downloaded the Spaces app by Wix that allows you to access more easily the content of my blog on the go. I hope you will also entice you to use the forum to interact with me and with each other. There's a lot of collective wisdom here and we can all learn from each other. Before we start the show this week, I want to share with you an important lesson that I learned this week. As I told you a few weeks ago, I haven't been really myself for the last couple of months. I suspected it may have something to do with the COVID booster shot that I got, but what do I know? I've just been very tired. I went to three different doctors here in Israel. The first one is the head of emergency medicine at one of the top 10 hospitals in the world. He said it couldn't be the vaccine because I don't have all the symptoms associated with the known side effects. The second doctor I went to is a very famous doctor who looks after prime ministers. He also says it couldn't be the vaccine because my symptoms have lasted too long. I went to a third doctor this week. He's not a famous doctor. He does not work at a big hospital. He told me it is possible that it is the vaccine. He says there is so much we don't know about COVID and the vaccines that nothing could be actually ruled out. Believe it or not, it was so great to hear someone said, I don't know, that I immediately felt better. I think our world is in such a mess because too many specialists and too many professionals are afraid of saying, I don't know. I hope I will always have the courage to tell you I don't know when I really don't know. With that, let's turn to the program this week. I want to talk about the government bond market this week, arguably the single most important part of the global financial markets. Well, the government bond market had a heart attack this week. The heart attack was so great that some very, very talented people lost a fortune, basically, in it. Now, after the dust settled, it appears that the investors still think that the Fed will be able to tame inflation without raising real interest rates. I think that's wrong. In fact, I'm going to make the case today why I think that financial conditions are likely to tighten a lot more than people expect in 2022. Devils in the detail, I'm going to try to explain to you why I think the fact that actually the Democrats are closing in on a massive fiscal stimulus could be actually the match that lights the fire in the bond market. Anyone who's done some shopping lately knows that inflationary pressure is going through the roof. In fact, it's very much of a global phenomenon. What I've done here is I've plotted the so-called trimming consumer price inflation for four very different economies, the United States, Euro area, Canada, and Australia. What is trimming inflation? Trimming inflation is a measure of inflation that strips out, okay, the outliers, the very high and very low components of inflation, so we get a less distortionary view of inflation at any given point in time. And yet you can see, you know, for all these four countries, inflationary pressure is absolutely accelerating, ripping, okay, in fact, especially the United States and Canada, where trimming inflation now is actually growing at a rate of three and a half percent on an annualized basis. The heart attack in the bond market was brought on by the sudden realization that maybe Jenny Yellen is wrong. Maybe inflation is not transitory. Maybe central banks won't be able to wait much longer sitting on the sideline because they have to do something about it. Okay, this realization set up a massive backup in government bond yields, especially at the front end of the government bond curve across a number of countries from Australia to Canada, New Zealand, Sweden, United States. To the extent the front end of the global bond market is where investors had been very long. This hurt, hurt a lot. As a result, the market is now pricing in two 25 basis point interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve in 2022. Considering the fact that the start of this month, okay, the market was pricing in less than one hike, wow, more than two represents a massive shift in investor expectations.
Indeed, two-year government bond yields in the U.S. shot up to 0.5%, which is the highest level in 18 months. There are two fascinating features in the new configuration of the bond market. But to understand what I'm talking about, you need to know some very basic bond math. In fact, all you need to know is that bond yields could be decomposed into two components, a real component and an inflation expectation component. And what these two charts on this slide demonstrate is that the massive surge in two-year government bond yields that I showed you on the previous slide has been driven to a great extent by an increase in inflation break even over the past few weeks. Because during this entire sell-off in bonds, we've actually seen declining real yields, as you can see on the top chart. What this tells you is that the market believes that, yes, the Fed is going to be hiking rates next year. But the pace of the Fed interest rate hike, believe it or not, is going to be lagging the pace of rising inflation. That is interesting. The second fascinating feature about the latest bond sell-off is the fact that while short-term rates, like two-year rates, went up, long-term rates, like 10-year rates, actually went down. In fact, 30-year rates went down even more. What does this actually tell you? I think one possible explanation is that the market thinks that increase in short-term interest rates is going to reduce the need for long-term interest rates to go up too. Well, everybody's focusing on the fact that, wow, the bond market is now pricing in two Fed hikes next year. To me, the real big story now is the fact that real rates are actually lower and long-term rates are actually lower. And this is the reason why I think financial conditions have remained extremely easy, as you can see on this chart here. This is my indicator for U.S. financial conditions. In fact, it's at the easiest level in more than 10 years. This is also the reason why, despite all the talk about the Fed hiking rates twice next year, the stock market actually hit a new all-time high last week. No, the stock market is not mad. It's not crazy. It is simply taking its cues from the bond market. And the stock market only cares about long-term real interest rates. As you can see on this chart right here, when long-term interest rates were going up in September, the stock market went down. Now that long-term real interest rates going down, the stock market is going back up. The stock market only cares about long-term interest rates because guess what? The stock market needs to basically discount future cash flow. And then to the extent it looks 10 years out, it only cares about where 10-year rates are. Okay, the reason why the stock market only care about real yields is because if you look at PE as a basically a measure for valuation of the stock market, it is actually a real measure as opposed to nominal measure. So from that point of view, I think that the stock market rally last week was entirely consistent with what's actually happened in the bond market. So what's wrong with this picture, a picture of rising short-term interest rates and rising stock market? Let me tell you, everything is wrong with it. What's wrong with this is the fact that it's completely inconsistent with what we know about how monetary policy is supposed to work. Think about it this way. Inflation is generally the result of too much demand relative to too little basically supply. In order, therefore, to bring down inflation, central banks have to slow down demand. And we know from basic economic theory that the transmission channels for monetary policy policy relies mainly through long-term interest rates and through real interest rates. Here are three channels for monetary policy transmission. The interest rate channel, the wealth channel, and the currency channel. Let's go through how each of these three channels works. Okay. Now, first, the interest rate channel. The idea is that the Fed, by raising short-term interest rates, pushes up the cost of borrowing, therefore making it more expensive for people to borrow, and because people borrow less, they spend less. Now, the important thing to remember is that most people borrow long-term as opposed to short-term. Just think mortgages. People borrow up to 30 years. Even businesses borrow some, somewhere between 5 and 10 years. So without pushing up long-term interest rates, okay, the interest rate channel technically is not working when you raise short-term interest rates. The second channel is the wealth channel. The idea is that the Fed, by raising short-term short rates, 
basically bring down the value of stocks and bonds. And when people have less money, basically, they also spend less. Okay. The third channel is the currency channel, which has to do with the fact that when the Fed raises interest rates, the dollar strengthens. When the dollar goes up, it makes U.S. export less competitive, less basic desire, and that brings down external demand that will help also mitigate inflation. The point here is for monetary policy tightening to actually have any effect on inflation, okay, long-term interest rates must go up, and I would argue long-term real interest rates must go up. We will go into more detail later, but right now I just want to say that I think that long-term real yields, volatility in the dollar, most likely will all have to go up in order for the Fed to have any fighting chance of taming inflation in 2022. My call for higher real long-term interest rates in the U.S. doesn't look that absurd if you look at what's actually what's happening in places like Canada and Australia, where real long-term interest rates have gone up a lot more than the U.S. over the course of the last six weeks. You're probably asking at this point, well, David, you know, it sounds like a pretty strong call that you're making. How can you be wrong? Where can you go wrong? There are actually three scenarios in which I could actually see inflation going down without tighter monetary policy. Number one, okay, if we were to see a new COVID variant developing this winter against which vaccines are less effective, that we actually end up with another round of shutdown, clearly the Fed won't have to do much basically tightening at all, okay? Scenario number two, of course, is that if we see a spike in oil price, especially above $100 a barrel, that pushes the economy into a recession, certainly in that scenario, the Fed won't have to basically tighten policy either for inflation to come down, well, at least for core inflation. And thirdly, you know, you could argue that if inflation ends up squeezing corporate profit margins sufficiently to cause companies to cut back on capex spending and hiring, that could also do the trick to the extent that it could bring down inflation without the Fed having to lift a little finger even. So let's go through each of these three scenarios and see where we end up. If you recall, two weeks ago in my podcast, I told you that we were on the verge of a new and fifth wave of COVID as the result of the waning effectiveness of the vaccines. Now, this is one prediction I don't want to be right about, but the fact is, over the last two weeks, if you look at the daily number of new cases globally, it's been actually moving up again, okay? Whether this is indeed the beginning of the fifth wave, I don't know for sure, but it's certainly starting to look that way. The number of new cases has been going up, especially in Europe, where countries as diverse as Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, Ireland have all seen the number of cases grinding higher over the last couple of weeks. While vaccines are less effective against infection over time, you know, studies show that they remain fairly effective against serious illness, hospitalization, or for that matter, death. But the fact that the number of new deaths has been also inching higher over the last couple of weeks globally, I think underscores the fact that the effectiveness of vaccine against serious illness is not 100%. And therefore, as more people get infected, even if they're fully vaccinated, you're probably going to see basically a rising number of hospitalization or death for that matter. As much as I think a fifth wave is unfolding, I do not think it will necessarily actually lead to basically big shutdown like we saw last year or even earlier this year. The reason being that I think countries are now becoming reconciled, that there is a cost, okay, in terms of maintaining extended shutdown. As a result, countries like the UK is now showing basically the rest of the world that there is a way to live with COVID, okay? This is the reason why despite basically, you know, high number of new cases or for that matter hospitalization in the UK, the UK government until now has not reintroduced shutdown. And from that point of view, I think this actually could very well become the model for other countries in the coming months, basically during the fifth wave. If you want to avoid another shutdown, then the only game in town will be boosters. 
This is why I continue to think that the market is underestimating the demand for boosters basically in the upcoming winter, or well, for that matter, beyond. This is also the reason why I continue to love basically owning Pfizer, which so far has been the best recommendation I've made so far over the last basically couple of months. And now it's about to basically break through its 50-day uh, moving average, and the seasonality is about to kick in for biotech in general. I think the stock is going to be heading higher from here. Certainly, it's a very good hedge against the possibility of not only the fifth wave, or even against a new variant in town. I told you last week that the magnitude of the increase in oil price over the last 12 months is already similar to the magnitude that we saw basically in the lead up to previous recessions over the last 20 years. There is no doubt if we were to see another spike in oil price, especially above $100 a barrel, I think we could be looking at a recession, which then basically reduced the need for the Fed to tighten at all. However, it's important we don't get ahead of ourselves. The very fact that the Dow Transport Index has been able to keep going higher, notwithstanding rising oil price, I think testifies to the fact that global recovery remains strong and that it can withstand higher energy prices. Therefore, at this point, I would argue that high oil prices is going to be more inflationary than actually recessionary. This is the reason why last week I recommended buying ExxonMobil as a hedge against the risk of higher energy price. I guess many of you guys agree, because despite the, uh, the sell-off in oil this past week, ExxonMobil actually inch higher. I continue to think this trade is going to do well. What I'm telling you is that neither COVID nor higher energy price is going to get the Fed off the hook, or for that matter, prevent long-term interest rates from going higher. This leaves me with only one risk scenario to consider, which is the possibility that inflation squeezes profit margin of companies so much that they end up having to essentially the, uh, reduce capex spending or stop hiring people altogether. Clearly, some equity bears are concerned by this risk, especially given the fact that producer price inflation continues to run hotter than consumer price inflation, as you can see in both the U.S. as well as in Europe. The most remarkable thing is that notwithstanding these concerns about margin squeeze, 83% of U.S. companies have so far reported better than expected earnings in this Q3 earnings season, which is barely shy of the 87% last quarter. Wow. Not only there is no evidence to suggest widespread squeeze of corporate profit margin, in fact, there is evidence to suggest that companies were able to increase their profit margin in Q3, the quarter that just ended. In fact, according to the National Association of Business Economics survey, okay, 25% more companies were able to increase their margin compared with those that saw basically margin squeeze in Q3, which is barely lower than actually in Q2, which is still basically very high relative to any time over the last three years. There have been many surprises about this pandemic, but there is no greater irony than the fact that, you know, COVID helped push U.S. corporate profit margin to all-time high. In fact, this is the reason why the stock market is trading at all-time high, thanks to COVID. Who would have thought? Corporate profit margins are so high that they ought to help companies to absorb rising wages, or for that matter, rising raw material cost. There's also the fact that capacity is not back to pre-COVID level. And as companies ramp up production, okay, in order to fully utilize their full capacity, this should also help reduce unit costs. And this is another very important consideration. Most importantly, companies seem to have quite a bit of pricing power. Look at this chart right here. The blue line denotes the unit price of the gross value added of non-financial corporation in the United States. What it shows you is that in Q2 this year, it went up by 5%. This represents the biggest price hike by U.S. companies in 
more than 20 years. Now you say, how can companies get away with this? And that's because consumers were on a shopping spree. In fact, as you can see here, household consumption expenditure, you know, has been growing at a rate we haven't seen in more than 30 years. Okay. In other words, the demand was so strong that consumers are willing to pay just about any price for what they want to get their hands on. You may be asking, so what's been driving this spending spree by the American consumers? Well, the reason is pretty obvious. It's called Uncle Sam. If you look at this chart right here, in blue, you've got you know, employee compensation, which consists mainly of wage income and salary income. In orange, you've got is government transfers to households. What this chart basically shows you is that over the last 18 months, the increase in transfer from the U.S. government to U.S. households has been so great that it's more than offset the little dip that we saw in wage and salary income during the slowdown contraction last year. In other words, that another great irony of COVID is that it's made U.S. consumers very rich, richer than ever. And then with all the handouts from Uncle Sam, no surprise, they went on spending like there is no tomorrow. And in fact, actually, this is only reinforced by the fact that you've got QE that's driving up house prices, driving up stock prices. As a result, as consumers feel wealthier, they went out and spend even more. And guess what? More fiscal stimulus is soon on its way. In fact, the news last week is that Democrats are now converging on an agreement of a $1.75 trillion social spending plan that includes universal pre-K, affordable housing, tax incentives for renewable and low emission, basically energy. Okay. And this is on top of the $1 trillion infrastructure plan that looks like it's already a done deal. By the way, Equally shockingly is the fact that both plans are very light on revenue measures. In fact, the latest, you know, basically proposal by Senator White to introduce a billionaire tax got dropped in the final deal that was uh, agreed to last week. You know, unfortunately, well, fortunately, depending on your point of view, okay, if these two bills are passed, this will represent another massive injection of stimulus into in U.S. economy, especially in the run-up to the election year. I think what's happened is that the Democrats have figured out with flagging approval rating of the president, the only way they're going to have a chance to winning or retaining their majority in both houses of Congress next year is by literally basically a spend their way to the midterm election in the hope that the economy is red hot so they can make the case that they need to be reelected. Unfortunately, the Republicans would like to be able to stop them, and they're certainly going to try, probably in December when the whole issue of the debt ceiling comes back. But unfortunately, the Republicans don't have too much leverage basically to stop them. So from that point of view, you got to basically think, you know what, there's going to be more fiscal stimulus, and that is going to be mean more inflation on the way. My bottom line is that financial conditions will have to tighten a lot more in 2022 than is generally expected. And this is because I think that without real interest rates, long-term real interest rates going up, there is no way the Fed is going to be able to tame inflation, especially given the massive fiscal stimulus in the pipeline. And as you can see here on this chart, which I've been showing you for the last couple of months now, given where wage growth is currently running right now at around 4.5%, the Fed is completely behind the curve. So from that point of view, they're going to have to play catch up. And catch up is not going to be fun for the market. There are two key events next week that I think will set the tone for all financial markets in the coming two or three months. Number one, you've got the FOMC meeting next week, at which the Fed is widely expected to announce the start of basically tapering of bond purchases. In other words, reducing their bond purchases. And they have said that they would like to basically stop, okay, basically buying bonds altogether, probably sometime in the middle of next year. 
The second major event next week is the possibility that actually the Congress, especially the House of Representatives, will be able to actually pass both the infrastructure bill as well as the social spending bill. What the Fed meeting is going to tell you is that bond buying from the Fed is going to go down. What the spending and the infrastructure bill passage is going to tell you is that actually bond supply is going to be going higher from here because we're going to be talking about even bigger budget deficit and more debt to be taken out by the U.S. government. The combination of less buying of bonds from the Fed and more issuance of bonds by the U.S. government, that certainly should mean higher interest rates and higher real interest rates. So my first trade I want to enter next week is to basically pay 10-year real yields. Okay. Now, it's easier if you could, if you are institutional investor than if you are retail investors. For retail investors, I would also recommend buying VXN, which is an ETF linked to VIX, because I do think that at this very low level of volatility, if I'm right, the long-term rates are going to start squeezing higher, especially real rates. I think it's just a question of when that volatility basically follows higher. Before I wrap up, let's just go through my honest board. I was, I went long Pfizer at 42, I'm up. I went long XOM at 64, I'm up. Okay, I was short Euro dollar enter at 116, I'm up there as well, small up. And I'm still short IWN, which I enter at 220, and I'm down quite a bit still there, but I'm not giving up yet. On that note, Talk to you next week.